Chapter 16 So there I was, back where I started. I had no money, no job, at least not until the next tour for all Japan, and nowhere to live, and for a while I moved back in with my mum and dad. But not for long. I was feeling a bit depressed, so I called Danny Spivey at his house in Tampa, Florida, and told him I was coming over. He was great about it, and picked me up at the airport, but as he drove us back to his house he told me he was going to Japan for a couple of weeks. He said, it doesn't matter Tommy. I want you to stay, and while you are here, my house is your house, and my car, which was a brand new Lincoln Continental, is your car. So, while Danny was away I relaxed, lazed around, and did absolutely nothing. To be honest, I couldn't remember the last time I'd been able to do that. A couple of days before I was due to fly home to England, Danny arrived back from Japan. He told me before I left that he had something special lined up for me. He said, Tommy, don't eat a thing today. Have a couple of beers, but don't eat anything. I don't know what it was that he gave me, this stuff was wrapped in toilet paper and you had to dissolve it. It might have been LSD. So I took it, and ten minutes later I started feeling funny, but I didn't feel good. When I stood up, I knew there was something wrong. I shouted, Danny, help me. He was laughing, he knew I was a joker, but when I shouted again, help me, Danny, he knew I wasn't messing about. I collapsed on the floor, and I must have looked bad because Danny called an ambulance. In fact, my heart had stopped and when the paramedics got there they said I had actually died. Danny told me all this later. One of them said, this is touch and go, and they had to put the resuscitator paddles on me, twice. I died, twice on the floor of Danny's house. A third time, and I think I would have had it. That was what they told me when I woke up in hospital. When the doctor came to see me, he told me I was lucky to be alive. He said. Have you ever taken steroids? I said, yes, I have. Why? He said, when we x-rayed your chest, we found some black scars on your heart. You see, when you were taking those steroids and working out, it wasn't just your biceps and triceps that got bigger. Your heart got bigger, because that's a muscle as well, which was something I'd never thought about before. He said that the scarring would take a couple of years to heal, and then if I was lucky, my heart would return to normal. But, he said, I would advise you not to take steroids again, otherwise you will be putting your life at risk. I was 32 years old, and definitely not ready for that. So as I lay there in that hospital bed, I made a decision, a promise to myself, that I'd taken the last drugs I was ever going to take. Steroids, cocaine, speed, halcyons, I'd finished with them. A few weeks later I was back on my feet again, but still feeling terrible. Somehow, I managed another trip to Japan with Johnny Smith. But it was a struggle. In fact, one night, I looked so ill, Baba wouldn't let me wrestle. He made me take the night off, which, apart from when I injured my back, was something I'd never done before. I only just made it through that tour before I went back to England to pick up some work there. And there was still work in England, Max Crabtree was still around, Brian Dixon and Oric Williams were running their own promotions, but as you can imagine, the standards of wrestling in 1991 were worse than ever. They were terrible. The first thing I noticed were the gimmicks. The WWF was being shown on television in England, and most of the English wrestlers were nothing but poor imitations of the Americans. I did a few matches for Oric Williams against Dave Fit Finley, who could wrestle, and Skull Murphy. I was the main event, and for that Oric was paying me about £130 a night, plus travel expenses. And because he billed me as the British Bulldog, with the name Dynamite Kid underneath in very small writing, he was selling out every night. You see, by this stage, 
Davy Boy Smith was appearing on TV with the WWF every week as the British Bulldog. And it caused a bit of trouble with somebody from the Trade Descriptions office, who turned up at the arena one night asking to speak to me and the promoter. Somebody had reported me for using a wrestling name without permission, according to them, I was an imposter. It was Davy Boy Smith's parents, Sid and Joyce, my aunt and uncle, who had seen me billed as the British Bulldog on a wrestling advertisement. They called Davy in Calgary and he'd got onto the officials to try and stop me using the name. Oric Williams, the promoter, pointed at me and said, there's the original Bulldog there. The man ignored him and said to me, you can't use that name. If you do, we'll have to take matters further. I said, I've been a bulldog all my life. You sue me, and I'll countersue the fuck out of all of you. The same thing happened at a show in Belfast, two complete strangers telling me I couldn't use my own ring name, telling me I couldn't be a British bulldog. I replied, I am a British bulldog. Furthermore, I have all the evidence, the videotapes, the programs, the pictures to prove it. And I will use that name tonight. You can either try to stop me or you can take me to court, but I'll sue the bollocks off the lot of you. So while Davy Boy Smith was making $20,000 for one night's work on a WWF pay-per-view, I was making £130, which by English standards, was great, but for some reason, that bothered him. The stupid thing about it was, that if it hadn't been for me, Davy Boy Smith would never have been a British Bulldog in the first place. Oric Williams said the same thing to Davy's parents when he rang them and told them to back off. He said, how can you carry on this game with Tommy, when you know for a fact it was Tommy who took him over there? They never gave him an answer, but the trades descriptions people never bothered us again. Some things hadn't changed at all in English wrestling. I did a few shows for Brian Dixon, who ran all-star promotions. I did a tag match for him in Bristol one night I can't even remember who it was against, I'd never seen them before in my life, and they were terrible anyway. When I came out of the ring, Brian Dixon had already left the building, but he had given my envelope with my pay to another wrestler, Drew McDonald. As soon as Drew handed me the envelope I said, this is wrong. Brian always gave me my money in my hand when I came out of the ring. I opened it and it was thirty pounds short. I got in my car, Danny Collins, and Skull Murphy had to come with me because we were sharing cars, and I found Brian Dixon up the road, at a pub called The Windmill, which was a famous picking up point for the wrestlers. I got out of the car, walked over to his, and asked him to wind the window down. I said, Brian, you've paid me short, and I know you've done this on purpose. Brian said, Dynamite, it's just a mistake. I said, Yes, it, it is a big mistake on your behalf Brian, and I want that thirty pounds now. He said, I've got no money. So I said, In that case you'd better find some money right now. He was still in his car and couldn't get out of the car park because I had blocked the entrance with my car. He said, Er, uh, Tommy, I'll tell you what, I'll send you a check. You won't send me a check, you'll pay me now you son of a bitch. I think that was when he realized I was being serious. Brian turned to the referee who was sitting in the car with him and said, give me thirty pounds, quick, which he did, and Brian handed it to me. That was also the last time that he booked me. But I carried on working for Oric Williams, and for a three or four month spell I was working up to seven days a week. I wrestled Skull Murphy and Dave Fit Finlay. I did a few tag matches with Johnny Smith when he came over to England for a few weeks. We did tours of Wales, Ireland, Scotland, all over England, and the crowds were great. We were in a bar one night having a beer after the matches and one Irish lad came up to me. I was just being polite when I said to him, all right lad. He said, I'm not a fucking lad. And I want my money back. 
I was wrestling as a babyface on this occasion, so I ignored him. All the other wrestlers were there, and they ignored him as well. Then he said, this isn't the WWF. I want my money back. When I came out of the bar, six of this guy's mates were waiting for me outside. That's when I realized their problem was nothing to do with the WWF or the British Bulldog. It was the Union Jack tight side been wrestling in. We were in Londonderry and I suppose they took it as an insult. So there were a few verbals out in the car park, but I looked at the six of them, and one of me, and thought, no way. I got in the car and drove back to the hotel. But I think that in spite of the rivalry, the promoters in England are really as thick as thieves. And I'm sure that Oric Williams had been talking to Brian Dixon, when he asked me one night if I would take a pay cut. I said, I don't think I should, and held out for my £130. I got it too, but that was my last night for Oric Williams, in spite of me drawing all that money for him. A few months later, Oric did call me back, asking me to do a show in Doncaster, Yorkshire. So I said I would. I was wrestling Skull Murphy in the main event, and Skull asked me to pick him up at a service station just north of Manchester. I told him to be there at 6pm, but I never went. And Skull never went because I didn't pick him up. So Oric Williams had no main event that night, which I thought squared things up between us. At the end of November 1991, Johnny Smith called me from Calgary to make sure I was still on for the end-of-year tag tournament in Japan. To be honest, I didn't think I could manage it. We'd done a tour about two months before that, and I'd had it in mind that that might have been my last for all Japan. I even told Joe Higuchi, but all he said was, what you need is a good rest, Tom. A few weeks. Then you'll feel better. So I'd carried on. But I knew this time would have to be my last time. I just couldn't do it anymore. The day we arrived in Tokyo, I went to see Joe. I said, I'm sorry, Joe, but this will be my last time in Japan. He just sort of laughed, as in, where have I heard that before? I said, no, you don't understand. This is the last time. Every time I go in the ring I get body slammed or suplexed, take backdrops. My body is in too much pain. So after this tour, I finish. No more. He said, what you should do is just take it a bit easier in the ring. Not so hard? You'll be okay, Tom. But that wasn't it. Injured or not, I've never taken it easy in the ring. When you are there, in a full arena, the fans all shouting your name, you want to do it. You want to provide. And whether I could or I couldn't, I'd still try. I mean, I'd gone to the ring in Japan many times with ripped knee cartilages. I just taped them up and got on with it. And one thing for sure was that your Japanese opponent would never take it easy with you. Joe did his best to change my mind, but I said, please tell Baba thank you very much, but the last day of this tournament will be my last day of wrestling in Japan. Word soon got around that this was going to be my retirement tour. The Japanese wrestler, Fuchi, came to see me. He said, kid. Please don't retire. Just take six months off. I said, what difference will that make? Tell Baba you will be back in six months, but don't say you are retiring. In his mind, Fuchi was thinking that maybe Baba would pay me some money if he thought I was coming back. But six months, a year, no amount of time away was going to make any difference now. I knew that for a fact. December 6, 1991, the day after my birthday, was the last night of the tournament, which was won by Steve Williams and Terry Gordy. Me and Johnny Smith wrestled, Johnny Ace and Sonny Beach. It wasn't a long match, and it ended when I suplexed Sonny off the top rope and pinned him, one, two, three. At the end of my match, 
all the Japanese wrestlers climbed into the ring all wearing track suits. They grabbed hold of me and threw me up in the air and caught me. They did that three times, and the people were all cheering and shouting, Kido, Kido, which I must admit made me feel a bit sad, because I knew I'd never hear it again. But they gave me a good send-off. And although I probably did feel a little bit down, maybe even depressed, there was no getting away from the fact that as far as my body was concerned, retirement hadn't come soon enough. I didn't go away empty-handed either. Back in the dressing room, the wrestlers presented me with a sweatshirt that everybody had signed. From Baba, I had a radio cassette player, and a few other presents from different people in the promotion. After the matches, we hit the Tokyo nightlife for the last time. The next morning, we were all at Narita Airport waiting to catch our flights to England or America. Abdullah the butcher came over to me and handed me a present. He said, there you go, champ. Something to remember me by. It was a watch. I said, thanks butch. Abdullah said, go on, fuck off. I think he was ready to cry. That was the last time I saw him. You say to people that you'll keep in touch, give them a call, but as I found out, once you've left the business, that doesn't happen often. Out of sight, out of mind is very true. In May of that year, I had become a dad again, to my second little girl, Amaris. The following year, the divorce was finalized. I never contested it. I left Michelle everything, the properties, the cars, the lot. All that mattered to me was that my three kids would have everything they needed. As you can imagine, on English wages, wrestling wasn't the best way to earn a living. So in 1993, when I had a call from Tokyo, telling me that Baba wanted me to come back to Japan, not to wrestle, but to judge some matches, I said I'd go. They flew me over, just for the one night, and all I had to do was judge the best match between Dan Spivey and Kobashi, Stan Hansen and Kawada, and Misao and Tao. When I walked into that arena, I got a great reception from the fans, as if they were really pleased to see me again. I sat at ringside next to the commentary table, watched the wrestling, and picked Misawa's match as the best. That was all I had to do. The next day, I was on a plane home to England. And for that one day's work, Baba paid me a full week's guarantee, $6,200. I thought it was funny, the way they flew me in and out like that. But deep, down, I knew why. They knew if I was there for a whole week, but only working one day, I'd have six days to get into trouble. A few weeks after that, against my better judgment, I did one more match with Johnny Smith for Baba, but it was a big mistake. It was terrible. If I hadn't needed the money, I would never have gone back. Not long after that final, final match for Baba, I had another unexpected phone call, this time from Bret Hart. He was over on a tour of the UK with the WWF and wanted to come and see me. He turned up with Scarpa, or Chief J. Strongbow, and Brian Nobbs. We sat and talked for hours, had a few beers, and then Bret said to me, Tom, do you want to come back to the WWF? I'm the top man now you know. I said, no, not really Brett. Even if I wanted to, I'd have to juice up a bit, as in, get back on the steroids. I'd maybe taken half a dozen shots since I had come back from Calgary. Brett said, oh no, you don't need to do any of that. I said, why's that? He said, nobody's allowed to take steroids anymore which made me smile because I knew that all the wrestlers had slimmed down a lot and they were saying things like, oh, I've lost weight, I'm going for the leaner look, which was bollocks. Anyway I said, no I'm in the main event with Dave Finley at the moment. Thanks for asking me Brett, but I'm doing okay. He said, okay, but if you do want to come back. And then Chief J interrupted him. We'll send you a ticket next week. 
which made me feel good, but I still wouldn't change my mind. You see, three years, four years on, it didn't matter. Once I'd told Vince I was finishing, I did mean it. And physically, I wasn't up to it anyway. It was around the same time that I heard Davy Boy Smith had left the WWF and joined WCW. But he didn't stay long, and by the end of the year, he'd left the company and was working for independent promoters. I knew that for a fact, because the following year, 1994, he was back in England working for Max Crabtree. When I heard that he was appearing on a card in Howe Bridge, a small village not more than a couple of miles from Wigan where I was living, well, I couldn't resist. I had to go. You see, the problems that eventually split up the British Bulldogs, had gone beyond just two wrestlers. They had affected both our families as well. My dad and Davy's mum were brother and sister, and a few years ago, had been very close. When my dad found out he was dying of cancer, that was the time when they should have been even closer. The doctors had diagnosed the cancer five years earlier, and his chances looked bad then. But he fought it, and managed five more years, five good years, before it finally took hold. They took him into hospital one weekend when I was away, wrestling in Germany. When I heard, I came home straight away to see him. I said, what's wrong, dad? And he told me the cancer was back. And this time, there was nothing they could do for him. Now, as I told you right at the start of this story, my dad was never a swearing man. Not even when he was working down in the mines, my own excuse is that I spent too long around other wrestlers. Davy's mum, Joyce, knew that he hadn't long to live and she called my mum, to ask if she could visit him. She told him, Billy, Joyce wants to know if she can come and see you. My dad was very weak at this point, very ill. But he turned round to my mum and said, tell them to piss off. Shortly after that, he died. He never did see Sid and Joyce again. When he went, I was devastated. I thought the world of my dad. So all of this was still fresh in my mind when I turned up at the wrestling hall in Howe Bridge. Davy was wrestling a tag match, and the first thing I saw when I walked in was a table full of his pictures. So I tipped the thing up, and the pictures flew everywhere. Max Crabtree came over, trying to calm things down, but in the middle of all this, somebody opened the doors to let the fans in. Max was shouting, close those doors. Then I saw Davy's dad. My uncle Sid. I said, all right, where is the fat bastard? He said, he's not here yet. I said, if you're here, he's here. Where is he? While all this was going on, somebody called the police and eventually about eight of them came. They arrested me, handcuffed me, and led me out of the building. I found out later that Davy Boy Smith had locked himself in a private dressing room. One of the last shows I did in the UK was in Croydon, in 1996. I did it because I needed the money, believe me, I didn't enjoy it. Anyway, after the matches, this little Japanese guy who had been in the crowd, came to see me. He told me his name was Hiroshi, and he was a booking agent for a new promotion in Japan called Michinoku Pro. And the promoter wanted me to go over there and work for him. I'll be honest, at first, I didn't take him too seriously. It had been three years since I'd stepped in a Japanese ring, and I knew then that I was a long way from looking good. Now I looked bloody awful. And I felt awful. I was having trouble with my back, my legs, my shoulder, in fact my whole body seemed to be in pain at some time or another. But I needed the money. Plus, I always liked Japan, and wanted to see it again, just one last time. Hiroshi asked me how much Baba had paid me when I was with All Japan. So I told him. $6,200 a week guarantee. He rang the promoter in Japan, a wrestler by the name of the great Sasuke, 
and eventually Hiroshi came back and told me that Sasuke would pay me the equivalent of £500, about $700. I said, how much? But Hiroshi said that was all Sasuke would pay, which was very poor compared to what I'd been used to earning in Japan, plus, physically, I wasn't even sure whether I was up to the 12-hour flight. But I said I would do it. The first time I went for Michinoku Pro, they wanted me there as a surprise for one of the wrestlers in the promotion. I was driven by taxi from the hotel to the arena, and I had to wear a mask, which I always hated because they made me feel sick. I walked down to the ring, and stood face to face with a man I hadn't been in the same ring with for 12 years. It was Satoru Sayama, Tiger Mask. When I took my mask off, he looked really shocked. He put his hands up to his face, like he couldn't believe it was me, although I'm sure part of it was the shock of seeing how much I had changed. Don't get me wrong, Sayama had changed as well. He'd gained a bit of weight, and looked chubbier than I remembered him, and he wasn't as agile as he used to be. It was hard to believe how fast those fifteen years had gone. I didn't wrestle that night, I just sat and watched the matches. They asked me to say something over the microphone, so I said something like, Sayama, Ichiban, or, Sayama, number one man. I watched Sasuke wrestle, and I must admit, he did some very dangerous moves, over the ropes, into the crowd. I mean, he had to have a lot of faith in his opponents who were catching him coming down. When he came into the arena before his match, I thought to myself, there's something wrong here, because he walked down the aisle with maybe seven or eight girls, all in single file, behind him, each one holding one of his belts up in the air. I thought, now that was what I called being glorified. But when Sasuke asked me to come back in October, he came to the ring with one belt, so I thought, fair enough, he doesn't always win. That second time I went, they wanted me to wrestle in a six-man tag match, myself, Kobayashi and a Mexican wrestler, Dos Caras, against Sasuke, Sayama, and Mil Mascaras. I wasn't feeling too good on the flight over, and by the time I got to the building I knew I was very ill. I kept getting that familiar feeling of lightheadedness and seeing spots in front of my eyes. I knew what was coming, just like I'd known on half a dozen previous occasions. I stood in the dressing room, trying to shake the feeling off, and saying to myself, Tommy, just hang on lad. Get the match over and get your money. You see, if anything had happened before the match, I knew I wouldn't get paid. So I drank about a gallon of water and kept shaking my head, saying, don't let it happen now. Please don't let it happen now. All I wanted to do was to get the match over and go home. I made it to the ring, the arena was full, and I'll be honest, the fans were cheering and clapping, like they were genuinely glad to see me, but I'm sure they must have been shocked at the way I looked. Thankfully, the other wrestlers did most of the work in that match, in fact they more or less kept to themselves in the ring. I never felt part of it, and to tell you the truth, it was just a big relief when the bell rang and I could get back to the dressing room. I was due to fly home the next day. I'd made it through the match, Sasuke had paid me, but that horrible feeling was still there in my head, something bad was definitely going to happen. I was feeling a bit down anyway, because I knew, for the first time in my life, I'd been booked for my name instead of my ability. The truth was, I didn't have any ability at that moment. But it was still a terrible feeling. Hiroshi, the booking agent, picked me up from the hotel and we caught the train to Narita Airport. I said to him, I will check in, while you change my money from yen to sterling. He disappeared. I put my case down, and that's when it happened. I suddenly felt warm, and light-headed and saw the stars in front of my eyes. I said, help, but my voice sounded like it was coming from a long way away. The next thing I knew, I was in hospital, aching from head to foot. I missed three flights home because of that seizure, but I knew I'd been lucky that it hadn't happened in the ring the night before. 
I never heard from Sasuke again. Hiroshi rang a couple of times to tell me about another new promotion in Japan called Battle Arts. He said, if you bring some more wrestlers from Wigan, you could be their manager Tommy. But for whatever reason, it never came to anything. The year after that, just when everything seemed to be as bad as it could possibly get, something good happened. I met my wife, Dot. She didn't know who I was, or what I'd done, never heard of the dynamite kid, never watched wrestling, but we hit it off straight away. All those years I was wrestling, I never knew whether people wanted to be around Tommy Billington or the dynamite kid. When you're a famous face on television, and you're earning good money and living a good lifestyle, as I did, you find all kinds of people coming out of the woodwork wanting to get close to you and be your friend. But when you're no longer that famous face, and the money and the lifestyle are gone, they crawl back into the woodwork. That's when you find out who your real friends are. We got married in 1997, and everything was great, until just a few months later, when my past finally caught up with me, big time. I'd noticed my legs and back were aching a lot more than they ever used to, and some days, it was a struggle even to walk or climb the stairs. I tried to ignore it, but I was worried. On a couple of occasions my legs just buckled under me and I collapsed. I'd managed to deal with the pain before, but now it was much more serious. I couldn't walk. I went to see a specialist at the local hospital, and he sounded hopeful that they could sort me out with surgery. They ran x-rays and tests, including a CT scan, and ten days later, I went back for the results, and to fix up a date for the operation. All I wanted was to be able to get back on my feet and walk. But as soon as the doctor walked into the room, I could tell straight away from the look on his face that it wasn't good news. He started off. Mr. Billington? I stopped him and said, my name's Tommy. What's yours? He said, Sam. Okay Sam, can you just tell me what's wrong with me altogether? So he gave it to me straight. Basically Tommy, the damage to your back is too extensive. What do you mean? He said, there's nothing else we can do for you. I said, but will I be able to walk again? He said, I can't be absolutely certain, but no, probably not. He told me there was nothing more they could do for me surgically, because there were complications from the original operation that I'd had in Calgary in 1986. There was too much scar tissue, and the chances of success were so slim, they weren't prepared to take the risk. I couldn't see what difference that made. If there was only a 1% chance of success, for me, it was still worth trying. In my opinion, they couldn't make things any worse. But he said no, he was very sorry, but he couldn't help me. That was it. I wouldn't walk again. I wasn't prepared at all for that. It was a bombshell. But I wasn't going to show it there in the hospital, so I thanked the doctor, politely, turned round to Dot and said, get me out of here. It was the end of the world and I really couldn't see any point in carrying on.